Hello again, I'm Paul Beckwith. So I'm talking about some very interesting um, ideas on how to address the climate crisis that we face. And the particular um, concepts I'm talking about fall under an umbrella called the mere reflection, M-E-E-R, reflection. The M-E-E-R stands for Mirrors for Earth's Energy Rebalancing. So the idea is to put arrays of mirrors at various uh, locations on Earth's surface, both on, in the ocean and on land, and reflect away substantial portions of the incoming solar radiation from these locations, thereby rebalancing the energy balance on the Earth and cutting global temperatures to um, attempt to offset um, the abrupt climate change that has already occurred. And there's other methods, uh, specifically using solar thermal collectors, for example, concentrated solar power to, um, for example, break down calcium carbonate and taking that will produce calcium oxide plus CO2 and then you capture that CO2, whether you bury it underground, you probably bury it underground in deep reservoirs and remove it from the atmosphere ocean system. Then you take that calcium oxide powder, okay, and you put it in the oceans and it further reacts with the CO2 in the oceans and forms the calcium carbonate again, which, which, which then descends down and goes into the sediment. So you remove CO2 from the atmosphere ocean system using, your, using the power of the sunlight and your mirrors, and you also use the mirrors to just reflect sunlight up back into space to, to cool the planet, okay? So those are the key concepts of this technique. So. This is part two I, of, of my videos. I discussed it in the previous video, the, the, um, some of the reasons why we need to do this as soon as possible. And some of the images in this video I was discussing here. So basically it's the thermal warning, warming, you know, the heating of the earth that is wreaking havoc havoc on, on, on plants and animals and humans, you know, around the planet. And it's a threat to, basically a threat to all life on Earth. So I was discussing this localized experiment where they used controlled heaters in an area and they raised the temperature a couple degrees, 2.6 degrees. And they found that the um, number of plants of a particular species dropped right off and they carried this out over, over a number of different years, and they found a huge reduction of seeds produced and eventual local extinction of this plant. So temperature is really bad, not just on land, but in the ocean. So here was, this was a marine heat wave. Um, if you remember the ridiculously resilient ridge and the huge uh, blob, if you like, um, of warm water in the Pacific and how it completely devastated, for example, sea stars, commonly known as starfish. Local, local extinction of sea stars from one to two degrees Celsius of warming um, in those regions off the western, um, in the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of the U.S. So temperature is deadly. And here's where we are. This is a nice comfort zone here for, for habitability, for residents of the earth, plants and animals and people. This is a comfort zone. And here's where we're heading, you know, very, very rapidly. This is the thermal tolerance of life, about two degrees between two and three, and then biological, planetary biological annihilation expected at above three. And we're heading there extremely rapidly. Um, so, and 100% renewable, is, is just not enough. We need to reverse a planetary scale catastrophe. This is showing what happens if suddenly today we switch completely to solar thermal, how the temperature would rise in photovoltaic. It would cut off a lot of the rise. Wind power, if we went all to wind, the argument, and I have to think about this more, is that 
friction from the wind with the turbine blades would cause a, a, a large would cause a, a heating. And there's a large jump here because of the lack of, of uh, aerosols in the air. You know, of, of, of okay. And if we went to all trees, um, we'd reduce the albedo, um, and that would cause a tremendous warming. So you know, we, we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, um, and we need to have some method like mirrors to um, take us uh, to us keep us in a survivable mode if you like. If you just stop burning coal right away of course the the dimming components would drop right the aerosols in the atmosphere cause a reduction of sunlight reaching the earth if you removed all the aerosols stop coal burning stop the sources of these aerosols the temperature would jump at, at least a degree maybe a degree to two degrees and that would also put us in the soup. So we have to phase it out, or if we stop burning coal completely, we'd have to counteract that effect with the mirrors or with so, some sort of solar radiation management. The aerosols have masked about a degree Celsius of greenhouse gas warming. So they're hiding the warming, the aerosols. If we got rid of the aerosols, we would see this force, we would see this increase of temperature. Okay, the climate sensitivity about 0.84 degrees Celsius per watt per square meter. The radiative forcing of the um, anthropogenic aerosols about 1.6. Multiply 0.84 times 1.6. Okay, um, and you can see, you know, you get, uh, that's over a degree. You get over a degree um, Celsius of warming if you suddenly chop the, the aerosols. Okay, so they looked at uh, first principles. We've got the sun, we've got sand, we've got the ocean, we've got the atmosphere, we've got people, and we've got the pollution. So these, we have an abundance of all of these things. Okay, so the idea is that you can, um, you know, you can make, um, if you use the sand, the, sand, the silicon, and you make, um, uh, glass and you put a thin film of aluminum on the glass because aluminum is most abundant you can then reflect a lot of light up and create these this concentrated solar power system um, which you can then use to create you know these these furnaces if you like to to create uh, glass to uh, power industry and to um, uh, generate power from concentrated solar power things and you can generate these mirror rays and if you covered uh you know now this seems like a huge percentage three to four percent of the earth's surface area with these arrays of mirrors you could lower the temperatures uh, to offset the uh, climate change global warming that we've had already you can use the um, sunlight in these concentrated solar systems to break apart calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and CO2. The CO2 you would bury, the calcium oxide you would then put into the ocean, it would react with CO2 producing the calcium carbonate and it would pull the, and then that would sink to the bottom so it would basically pull CO2 out of the water and reduce the ocean acidification problem. Um, if you had 0.2% of the Earth's surface covered with concentrated solar power, which is 100% renewable, you could um, power, power the planet. Okay, and the scale, these things are large scale. If you put it all in the ocean, it would be about this size. On the land, it would be, combine it with the land and the ocean, and you need, the, you need a huge area, 15 to 20 trillion square meters, uh, to deploy these, these, these mirrors. But then how durable would they be? That's my biggest question. I think putting them in space is, is a better bet um, because you know gravity free environment you could use thin mylar sheets coated with aluminum and have much lower mass of material and with the SpaceX uh, deployment systems that are getting better and better I think we need to revisit that idea it wasn't feasible 10 or 20 years ago but now it is so here's how what we what the modeling shows what would happen if we had the, all mirrors for solar radiation management, so just mirrors reflecting light from the sun back up into space. 
then 100% mirror solar radiation management. It's not gonna deal with the CO2 issue. It's still, CO2 is still gonna go up, but it will lower the temperature from here we go about 1.25, 1, you know, approaching 1.5. It would lower it right down. So it would offset all of the warming that's occurred in this case. If it was 100% mirrors for solar thermal uh, energy, and then creating the uh, calcium, reacting with the calcium carbonate, producing the calcium oxide, capturing the CO2, and uh, putting the calcium oxide in the ocean, then that would greatly reduce the CO2 level, but not the temperature that much. So you want a combination of these type of things. You want to do both, and then direct air capture isn't, isn't going to be feasible to be scaled up. So why is ocean liming the only rational CO2 capture method, well, capture from thin air, direct air capture, 200 bucks a ton. These um, solar, you know, the, these solar uh, concentrate, like, so, so here you have a big solar furnace, basically, and you, you, uh, you can, can it's 30% heat to chemical efficiency, and you generate, you, you break down, so you use this to take to react with cal to react calcium carbonate, break it down into calcium oxide plus CO2, which then you bury, and that's at ten dollars a ton. Okay, then you take the calcium oxide and you put it in the ocean, and it dissolves very quickly, absorbing CO2, and then that CO2 and that creates calcium carbonate, which then goes down to the seafloor. So you're pulling huge amounts of, of CO2 out of the oceans. And uh, where do you get the uh, calcium oxide from? Uh, you can take shellfish. You know, if people ate more and more shellfish from the oceans, mussels, clams, scallops, you could take those shells, you heat them up to a thousand Celsius, you generate the crushed powder, calcium oxide powder, and then you, you that's your source. And it's estimated that for, you know, if everybody ate those, um, more, more and more of that, um, those calcified um, sea creatures with or sea creatures with calcified uh, shells, then that would generate enough calcium oxide to reverse ocean acidification. Okay, eating only oysters would save the world. Everybody have oysters every day. Uh, well, no, you can have lobsters and you can have other shellfish as well. But the numbers are the numbers are all very interesting. And how, where do you how do you get enough oysters and shellfish to feed the world? Well, you do your 3D aquaculture. Okay, so you do permaculture, but in the ocean you have all these chains descending. So if we were stimulating phytoplankton blooms, generating you know the zooplankton would gather. We'd go up the food chain. If we had these anchor mechanisms. You know, then we could we, we would be producing lots of oysters and et cetera, et cetera. And predators of oysters are you know lobsters and crabs and things, and uh, they're also very they're very tasty. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so there's a lot of this is the website, mirrorreflection.com, and there's lots of resources on this site, lots of videos, and you know mirrors can save the world you know, is the plan, okay? And there's various teams of students in all these different groups, okay? All these different groups of related things. And um, this is a conference uh, paper that was done on, you know, a, at a drawdown conference, right? Showing the ideas and the concepts of some of these, um, some of these mere uh, ideas. Okay, and I guess one of the biggest questions I have I'm concerned about is the durability of mirrors, both floating in the ocean and on land. And you have to make sure that the, the mirror is, the, the aluminum is sealed between a couple different substrates or it will just corrode and no longer reflect. And, uh, you know, I still think that, you know, we need to look at the idea of space mirrors. My guess is that you know, with SpaceX having more and more success in space, mylar sheets, aluminized, aluminized mylar sheets up in space to reflect a small percentage of the sunlight would, would sufficiently cool the planet. Anyway, thank, thank you for listening. And uh, please, uh, please support my work by going to paulbeckwith.net and uh, donating to help my, me in my research and videos. 
Thanks again.